Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here this morning and to bring God's Word and share with you uh, in the service. We're going to turn together, please, to 2 Kings and chapter 4. 2 Kings and chapter 4. And we're going to commence to read this beautiful uh, passage concerning a lady who found herself in a dreadful dilemma. And we read how the Lord wonderfully intervened for her. What I love about um, reading the Bible, I'm finding more and more now in studying that I uh, tend to spend less and less time in, in books, and I do thank God for books, but I spend more and more time now just, just reading the Bible and over and over again, and it's just wonderful how the Lord speaks to us through His Word. And um, so often in the life of Elisha and Elijah, in fact, all the Bible characters you're always introduced to the realm of the supernatural. And of course, that is absolutely ordinary to God. The supernatural is natural to God. And I think it was Leonard Ravenhill who said, if our lives are not in the realm of the supernatural, then they're in the realm of the superficial. So that's a very strong but true uh, challenge to all our hearts. And we're going to read then from 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? She said, Thine handmaid hast not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all these vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and the oil stayed. And she came and told the man of God. And he said, Go sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. Amen. And God will bless the public reading of his word. Let's unite again in prayer together. Our Father, we thank you that we can come this morning into your house, Lord, and gather around thy word. And we pray for the help of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that we might know your touch and the consciousness of your presence. Lord, I recognize my complete helplessness and emptiness before thee today. And Lord, afresh, I give myself unreservedly to thee, body, soul, and spirit. And I claim thy cleansing and sanctifying power upon my whole being. And Lord, I pray for thee the unction and help that God can give. So, Lord, by faith, I take the promised Holy Ghost, the blessed power of Pentecost, to fill me to the uttermost. I take, and I thank you that he, the Holy Spirit, will undertake. And Lord, I do take authority over every spirit and every power that would seek to, Lord, prevent the operation of thy word. O oh God, I take authority over every power in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I pray that we would become conscious of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. This particular passage is taken up primarily with the provision of the Lord the Lord's provision to a woman who had a lot of needs. And of course, you and I will know in the story of life that we're always meeting needs in life. It's just part and parcel of growing up. And as we enter into different uh, phases and seasons in our lives, so there are needs. And of course, as we grow up and grow older, we recognize that life is full of seasons and uh, how often we transfer from one season in our life into another. And it's only when we're in the new season 
Uh, we suddenly realize that there's a part that we had for a long time, and that part is now gone. And life is full of seasons. And this woman had come to such a season in her life, but it was one that was not uh, to be looked forward to. She wasn't particularly uh, taken with what lay before her. And of course, many people can find themselves uh, for various reasons in that position. And the Bible says that this woman, uh, she cried to the Lord. Now, had she not cried in verse 1, undoubtedly there would have been no miracle. Uh, I don't believe that verse 7 would have occurred, or 6 either, if verse 1 had not occurred. It's very interesting when we read in the Bible of those who cry to the Lord, that when they cry, you often discover that there's a deliverance comes. The psalmist said, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him. I'm sure perhaps the problem that we have is that we don't cry enough to the Lord, that maybe we're too independent. We maybe have everything too much under control. And sometimes uh, the desperation of our situation drives us to cry. And crying to God is a very scriptural thing, and it's something that is necessary. You'll never find a servant of God You'll never find someone who has been used by the Lord who did have not regular experiences when they cried to the Lord in their desperation. Now, this woman found herself uh, crying to the Lord for several reasons. The first one she draws to the prophet's attention is that she is a widow. She has come through that very painful experience of losing her partner in life. She has lost her husband. And uh, she's telling the man, she said uh, that the, to, the, to the man of God, she said, thy servant, my husband, is dead. And of course, uh, only those who uh, can experience that understand it. I was calling with a lady yesterday who lost her husband just a few months ago and uh, how difficult it was uh, with her and her, her, not only has she lost her husband, but now her youngest daughter is going to hospital for chemotherapy, a young girl in her 20s. And to be in that home, uh, to just uh, be with them and to witness and to see the effects that that has brought into that home. And so this woman was saying, uh, she said, there's death has come. I have lost my husband. And uh, those who have experienced that will understand uh, just how difficult that is. But that was her, that was her plight. She's, death has invaded. Uh, and it seems to me, I don't think I'd be out of order in saying that most probably he was a relatively young man. I don't think he would have been an old man because he was one of the prophets and also the fact that his children were going to go into bondage uh, indicated that they weren't old enough to hold a job. They were young children, and she obviously lost a husband, and she was a young woman, and she had lost her husband. Now, that was bad. But then the Bible says that not only was um, this woman's plight that she had lost her husband, she said that the creditor is coming. And what she's saying is he's on his way. The creditor is on his way. The man who is owed money, now how that were the case, we're not told, but somehow um, they had found themselves in a position of debt. And uh, it's not a good place to be. I've been there on occasions. And it's not pleasant. It can be very, very stressful. And the thing about it is holding uh, the grief of a loved one and losing a loved one and carrying debt uh, is quite a combination to have to endure. So she's moving from grief to what she's lost to grief to what she's going to lose, because the threat is that she's going to lose her children. So you can imagine the plight. You can imagine the anxiety. This woman wouldn't have slept at night. This woman would have tucked her children into bed, and the problem is we discover then that she didn't even have beds for them. So she maybe just lay down beside them on an old rug or an old uh, bag or something, just lay beside them trying to comfort them and probably keeping from them the fact that there were creditors coming to take them and put them into slavery. So in the situation, this woman cries to the Lord. She cries. 
The Bible says, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son that he receiveth. And if you don't experience trials and testings in your Christian life, if you can't really discover and find that God is doing things of testing in your life, then what you have to do is examine and find out, really, am I in the faith? Because it's one of the acid tests of being a Christian. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son that he receiveth. Well, why does God scourge? Why does God, as it were, like a parent, come and permit uh, things to happen just as when we were children? Our parents made us do things we didn't want to do. They made us go to school. They made us eat food we didn't like. They, they did. Th why, why does it? Well, it's always for our good. The Bible says that he does it so that we will become partakers of his holiness. He does it in order that we would become like him. He does it in order to prepare us for a holy city. He prepares us to have communion with him, a holy God. There's always a purpose in it. So often in our lives, I'm sure, that we miss the trial. We miss the purpose of the trial. Instead of praying sometimes, we complain. Instead of saying, Lord, all right, I'm in this plight. You have me here. What are you trying to say to me? What is it that I'm missing? Because the Bible says we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. And when a trial comes into our lives, no matter what it is, it doesn't have to be ever viewed as bad. It doesn't have to be viewed as being rejected. Certainly when problems come in our lives, we need to pray over them, and we need to pray until we get an answer. Paul did that. He, he, he sought the Lord thrice concerning a thorn in the flesh, uh, and the Lord answered him on the third time. If Paul hadn't got an answer on the third time, he would have prayed 333 times. He prayed until he got an answer, and the Lord said, no, I'm keeping this with you because this is part and parcel of my enabling you to be who you are and to minister as you do. I'm making you weak so that I can really strengthen you by my Spirit. And Paul got to the place then where he said he welcomed infirmities. He welcomed them. Problems that came into his life, he didn't reject them as so often is certainly my experience. I haven't matured enough spiritually where I can uh, uh, welcome them yet, but I hope as I seek to go on with the Lord that maybe the Lord will bring me there that I will welcome them. But what I am finding is that I can say to the Lord, well, Lord, whatever you have let into my life up to now, and there have been very difficult things have come, Lord, your word says that these things work for my my good. And so I can take that event, and I can take that situation, and say, Lord, I'm not letting this just go through passively. I'm not going to be beaten by this. I'm not going to let it destroy me. But what I'm going to do is, Lord, I'm going to, with your grace, come through it, but I'm coming through it with faith. Lord, you're going to do something good out of this, because your Word says that it works together for good. And so I can take any event in my life, and if I choose, if I choose to, I can make it a blessing. It's really how we handle things and how we work with them. So this woman cried to the Lord. Now, the great privilege that this woman had in that she did cry was that she had the ear of the prophet of the Lord. That was a great privilege in Israel's time to have access to the man of God, to have access to the man who was in touch with God, the man who knew God's voice, the man who spoke as God's representative. She had access to the man of God. She knew where the man of God was. She could get to him. Now, it's wonderful to have a man of God when I first studied this, I remembered meditating on it and thinking about all the people that God had brought into my life over the years. So many men and women of God, 
some of them for a long time, some of them for a short time, just according to his purpose. But how blessed and how enriched my life has been through so many servants of God. And you know, if I was in trouble, I have loads of telephone numbers at home, loads of them. And I could ring many servants of God, and I could ask for prayer, I could ask for help, so many. And I'm sure most of us this morning would have access to people of God, people who, who know the Lord, who are walking with the Lord, and who desire His will, and they would pray, and they'd give us guidance. But listen, my friends, there are millions this morning in Ireland who have no access to a man of God millions this morning who go to a religious leader, who go to some person with, with religion strapped around them, and they are depending, they are leaning on them. And they have no access, no access to a man of God. No access. You could take entire counties virtually in Ireland, and there are people, they have no access access to a man of God. Perhaps you take it for granted. Perhaps we all do. The Bible says, unto whom much is given, much will be required. Her privilege was the relationship with this man of God, and of course, that was her contact to the Lord. You know, brothers and sisters, this morning, our contact is not primarily with the man of God, but thank God for him and the woman of God. But we have access, the Bible says, into the very presence of God. Through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we who are sinners and rebels can come right into God's presence. We can come before God's throne. We have access. I was listening to a man recently on the radio. He was a sports character, and he had been knighted by the Queen or awarded OBE, something of that nature. And he said what a privilege it was to have those few moments with the Queen of England and that she asked him two questions. What a privilege, he said, to have access for a few moments to the Queen of England. And yet you and I have access 24 hours a day into the presence of the King of all kings and Lord of all lords. How much do we avail of the access? You see, friends, where we find out spiritually where we are, we all have different—it's uh, like a man one occasion, he came, him and his wife had an odd ding-dong now and again. And he used to come in when she wasn't there, and he said, you know the problem with my wife, he says. He always said it when she wasn't there. He said, you know the problem with my wife? She's not as spiritual as she thinks she is. Well, I think that could be written over us all, couldn't it? Not as spiritual as he thinks he is. You see, friends, how do you find out where you are spiritually? How do I find that out? Some people do it by the church they go to. They say, well, I believe this, 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 and this. So I'm spiritual. No. I go to an evangelical church, so I'm spiritual. No. I go to several meetings a week. No. What is the acid test of whether I'm spiritual or not? It is very simple. How long could you spend alone? in the presence of the Lord on your knees without getting bored. Let me ask it again. How long could you spend alone in the presence of God on your knees without getting bored? That will tell you where you are spiritually. <coughs> That's the acid test. You see, friends, the real truth is today that many Christians are not walking with God. They're good people. They're nice people. Don't get me wrong. They're very friendly people, very faithful people, but they're not walking with God. 
They don't know the will of God. They don't know the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And as a result, the church is dying on its feet instead of moving on its knees. And as long as that remains the case, then sadly there is really no hope for the land. If it weren't for the fact that there are individuals, there are people who, who are saying, well, that is where I am, but I, I, it's going to change. That's, that's the key. You see, this woman had access to God. And she utilized that access in her crying. And what she said concerning this um, privilege, she had access to the man of God. But what I want you to notice is that the access came in her case through her husband. You see, her husband was a very spiritual man. He was a godly man. And what she says about him is very interesting, especially in Old Testament Scripture. The words are very important because what she said is, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest. This was the prophet of the Lord. He knew everything God chose to use. Do you think, my friend, I I was in a Bible college, and the principal, the late Dr. Colin Peckham, was a very godly man. And he knew us as students. He knew where we were spiritually. He could have brought us into his office and explained to us where he felt there were flaws in our lives, where there were flaws for the future in a ministry, and he would have pointed them out in grace where they were and where we needed to make alterations. He knew us. And she said, you know, and you knew my husband because he was in the school of the prophets. It was like, like a large Bible college. That's, that's where Elijah or Elisha came to teach the prophets. And she says, you know that my, that your, my servant, you knew that my servant, he did fear the Lord. He feared the Lord. Now, that, she wasn't saying my husband goes to gospel meetings. She wasn't saying that my husband goes to the midweek prayer meeting. She said, my husband feared the Lord. What did she mean by that? The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Without the fear of the Lord, you can't have wisdom. You can't be wise. And sadly, many Christians are not wise. They live for the world. They live for money. They live for their reputation. Their hearts are full of jealousy, full of pride, full of worldliness. They look okay, but there's no light really shining. They're just as bitter as other people. They're just as vindictive with their tongue. Many Christians, I mean, you don't need somebody like me to come and tell you that, but that's where we are. You say, well, there's, I mean, at the end of the day, we ought to have our our tongue. You can't have your tongue under control. You can't can't have your your life under control. You've got to to be be, be wrong here and wrong there. Isn't that what the the Bible teaches? Isn't that that normal? Well, if it is normal, friends, I want you to come and tell me afterwards what it says in the book of Romans where Paul said, sin shall not have dominion or rule over you. For you are not under the law, but you are under grace. Now, I haven't at all figured out. I'm on my way just like anybody else, but but my Bible tells me that. My Bible says that, that I can have victory over sin. I don't always do it, but my Bible tells me that I can have victory over sin by grace. Sin shall not have rule in your life, over your life. For you're not under the law or legalism or rules, but you're under grace. In other words, grace is the source. So grace, if I, if I draw on grace enough, the Bible tells me that grace will give me victory in my tongue. Grace will give me victory in my life. Grace will give me victory over the world. Grace will give me victory over the power of the devil. Grace, unmerited favor. It's the grace of God that, that we need every moment in our lives. And as we learn more and more, and as we submit more and more to God, then that grace can become a greater flowing in our lives. It it can produce more and more of Christ's likeness into our lives. This woman said, my husband feared the Lord. What does it mean? 
To fear the Lord means to be in awe of God. It means to be so reverent. It means to have a consciousness that God is infinitely holy, that while He is dwelling in us, and He's near to us, and we can cry by His Spirit, Abba, Father, yet when we come before Him, we are awed by Him. In the Psalms I was reading during the week where it talks about praising the Lord in Psalm 147, 148, and and it starts with, with, praise Him in the skies, the skies, the heavens, praise the Lord. Then it talks about the armies of heaven. I was meditating upon that during the week. The armies of heaven, great battalions of angels, millions of them, And the psalmist calls out and he says, Armies of heaven, praise the Lord. You see, friends, when a person is full of the Holy Spirit, praise is not something that's extracted from you like a tooth. If it's not in you, it won't come out of you. The Holy Ghost must put it in you first, for it, it's like a river. Jesus said, out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him had not yet received. You see, she said, my husband feared the Lord. He was in awe of God. Now, it's not a wonderful testimony that this woman turned around and said, my husband feared the Lord. My husband, money wasn't number one in his life. My husband, he led by example before his children. He was a man of prayer. He was a man that taught his children how to walk with God. He didn't have a bad temper. He didn't have a lustful heart. He didn't have a, a love for money and zeal. He didn't leave that behind him. He feared the Lord. He taught us the fear of the Lord. Well, this is a challenge to us husbands. What would our wives say about us? My husband fears the Lord. My husband regularly goes in. You see him. He's, he's waiting on God. He's on his knees. My husband seeks. He's a man of God, my husband. You see, friends, one of the big problems today in the church, and you find it consistently in the New Testament, and the Lord hated it, and it's called hypocrisy. It means acting. Acting. And we're all professional actors. And it doesn't register with God. He doesn't read it. He doesn't accept it. He doesn't accept it. Do you know what we really need? We need a baptism of honesty. Just being honest with God. Tell him it as it is, because he knows it anyway. Do you remember he came to Adam and he said, Adam, where are you? Do you think God didn't know where he was? What God wanted Adam to do was just tell God where he was. That's all he wanted. He just said, Here I, this is where I am. I'm hiding. I'm covered. Sure, I'm not right. I'm full of fear. But I'm coming out into the open. I'm telling you where I am. Do you know you need honesty with God all the time? All the time. Absolute honesty. Transparency. That was the privilege. She had... She had this access to the man of God because of a husband, the influence of a godly husband into the home. See, some people, I hear people regularly saying to me, oh, our church is dead, or our church is nothing, and, and so on and so forth. Listen, friend, it's not like that. It's not that any church is dead. What's wrong is the people in the church are dead. What's wrong is that the people are not living right before God in their homes. They're not in fellowship with God at home. So therefore, when they come on a Sunday morning, they have nothing to say because they've had nothing to say to God all week. It just can't be done. And the, the great tragedy of it is that we're missing out so much. You know, sometimes, even as a Christian, I have been rebuked. I've had people write letters to me even while I was preaching about this. But I have a fear of the judgment seat. I have a fear someday I'm going to meet God. You know, sometimes I talk to my wife and I say, I feel like I'm a backslider. I feel I don't know God at all. I feel I know so little about Him. 
When I read books of men that God has used, women that God has used, I feel as though I'm tinkering about, I'm fooling and fiddling about. And that's not make-believe. I'm telling you the truth. That's what I often feel. I feel I'm so far behind. And yet people think, oh, well, you're doing well. You see, my dear friends, this woman was introduced to the supernatural. And as I've said at the beginning, the supernatural, if your life's not supernatural, it's superficial. It's one or the other. Now, the man of God, when he got this woman, he said, listen, what, what, what do you have in the house? Do you know so often God doesn't just come in and zap your situation? God doesn't come just and solve your situation? Do you know what God does? God uses what you have. He uses what you have. Nehemiah, when he heard the word that the walls were broken down, he got before the Lord, and he wept, and he cried, and he said, Lord, please step in Jerusalem. Lord, he was a cupbearer. He he had a good job working for the king. Oh, God, please move. Do something. Do something wonderful, Lord, out there in, in Jerusalem. Get the walls built. Lord, please. And the Holy Spirit says, yes, absolutely. Off you go. Don't ever pray for a missionary unless you're prepared to be one. Don't ever go ask God to bless in the mission field or bless someone in it unless you're willing to go. Don't ask God to go and move in something unless you're willing to put your money to it or put your life to it. Don't bother. It's like D.L. Moody on one occasion, This he was, they were looking for a new building. He was sitting, and whenever they were, they were praying, uh, uh, this, these businessmen, they all said, well, we're going to have a wee prayer. And so they started to pray, and one of them prayed, Lord, we pray that you'll send the money to do this, whatever it is. And Moody stopped him. He's a big businessman. Moody stopped him and said, excuse me, sir, I don't think we'll bother troubling God about that. She used men can look after that. You know, we'll not, we'll not, I mean, that's a waste of time telling God to send them. She you have it. It's just you need to open your bank balance. It's just you do it. And the Lord uses what we have. See, it's so easy to say, Lord, you do this and you do that and you do the on and you move on there and you move here. Do you know the real prayer meetings, when a prayer meeting really gets the presence of God into it, when people start to say, Lord, come and search me. Come and deal with my life, Lord. Lord, I've fell out with my neighbor or I've, or I've, I've had words with this one or this or that, whatever it is. Lord, come and, come and, come and work in my life. Come and show me, Lord, whatever's next. That's, that's when you get the presence of God. You could go to prayer meetings where they'll pray for Timbuktu or missions on the moon, and you could have the most eloquent prayer, and it's not worth that. Waste of breath. Until you cast yourself in on that. He said, what have you? She says, of nothing. Well, I suggest to you that she sold everything. She was a good mother. Sold the bed, sold the table, sold the lamp, sold everything to try and get these creditors held off to keep her boys. Any mother worth her salt will do that. But she says, I've one wee thing. And you know, in one of the other versions of the Bible I was reading at home, it brought out the, the thought that it was kind of like an afterthought. She just says, well, there's, there is a wee pot of oil. There's this wee thing. It's not worth very much, but it's there. So by the providence of God, she had nothing except a little, little jar of oil. Well, I'm sure most of you know that oil is always a picture of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. She says, I have nothing but a little bit of oil. And you know, friends, whenever the man of God heard that, he said, well, what can I do for you? Or what can the Lord do for you? Well, what the Lord can do for you is use what you've got. You're going to have to let go of the oil. You're going to have to pour it out. You can't keep it safe and see a miracle. You can't keep the lid on it and see the supernatural. It's like the little boy, you remember, with his lunchbox. Remember the, the disciples, the Lord said, well, is, uh, uh, you know, the, is there any food? And the disciples go out, and there's a wee boy sitting, and his granny has made him a lunchbox, and he's sitting there with it, and he's ready to eat it, and it's his. He says, well, the Lord says, come on, do you want to give? The disciple says, you want to give Jesus your lunchbox? He wants it. Jesus wants my lunchbox. 
What good's my lunchbox? Well, Jesus wants it. I've really enjoyed him preaching. I've really enjoyed watching him and listening to him, but it is my lunchbox. My granny made it for me. It's mine. Why should I share it? I'll get none. If I give it away, what am I going to get? That's the mentality of the average Christian. If I give it away, what am I going to get? I have things I want to do in my life. I have my agenda. Sure, I'll go to meetings. I'll throw a few shillings on the plate. But I have my own thing I want to do. Okay, do it. Do it. But the little boy said, okay, Jesus wants it. Well, in simple faith, I'm giving up my lunchbox. It's mine. I have the right to keep it. God's not snatching it from me. He's just asking me to volunteer it up. I'm giving up. And he gave up the lunchbox. And the Lord Jesus took it. And the little boy didn't know what was going to happen, whether he'd ever see another bite. But after a short time, baskets start coming around, all the bread. And one of the disciples come around. And the wee boy says, where'd that all come from? From your lunchbox. My lunchbox? Yes, yours. The little bit that I gave to Jesus, yes, he broke it. It's amazing. He broke it, and he, he filled all these baskets, and he's fed all these people. And look, you're far more now than you had before. Do you think that little boy, when he grew up to become a man and a father and a grandfather, he didn't relate that story? Do you think he didn't tell his children about the day when he gave up all he had, and the Lord Jesus took it, and the Lord Jesus performed a miracle? Listen, he could have ate the, the, bre the little food himself and gone home and had no miracle and had no story to tell. Oh, the tragedy of it. Millions of believers with no story. No story to tell. No supernatural. No breakthrough from God. No reality of God. What a, what a tragedy. The tragedy of it all, my friend, is that this abnormal that we call normal in the church is accepted as normal. That is the greatest tragedy of all. That's the thing that's so glaring. It's just so apparent. And it must be an awful grief to the Lord. It must be an awful pain to him. It must be. He says, give up the oil. Listen, my friends, this woman was in desperation. She did what the Lord did. That's often why the Lord brings us to desperation in our lives. It's in order to get us to a place where we will move. He pulls the feathering out of the nests, and the thorns start to prick us, and life's not as comfortable as it was, and things aren't working the way we want it. I remember that happening in my life. It happens fairly frequently in my life, but I'm, I'm learning that God has a plan. God has a plan, and my duty is to find that plan. I can't find the plan of God for your life. I'm not responsible. You're responsible for that, but my responsibility is to find the will of God for my life. Answer this question, not out loud, but in your heart. Do you know the will of God? Do you know why God saved you? Are you in the right church this morning? You should know those things. How are you getting on? How many years? It was like a boy said one time, he says, I'm saved 50 years. I've been on the road. He says, in the road 50 years. The boy says, well, why don't you just get out of the road and find let other people buy People come out and say, I'm saved all these years. They nearly want a blue Peter badge or something. The door for how long they're saved. It's not, my friend, how long you're saved. What have you done? Do you know God? Or do you know God better? Are you walking with God? Is God real in your life? Do you have a greater appetite for the Scripture? Have you a greater appetite for time alone with God? I was in a meeting recently, and I was talking along these lines. And this Christian fellow came up to me afterwards. Do you know what he said? He said to my shame, I'm saved so many years and I hadn't a clue what you were talking about. He said, I understood it, but I had no experimental knowledge. I hadn't a clue what you were talking about. Not a clue. You see, friends, the Lord says, give out, pour out the little bit of oil. You and I have the Holy Spirit, and this morning there may be areas where your life, where maybe you have resolved and settled where you are. Maybe you have accepted the status quo. Maybe you have said, this is it. This is as far as I go. I can't move any further. I've tried in the past. I've given up. I'm just settled where I am. That's it. 
The Holy Spirit who dwells inside you strives and longs inside you to work and operate to reveal God. That's his desire. He longs for you to get to know God. He longs for that. And so often it requires this hungering. I remember a young man, a Christian. He actually belonged to a Baptist church just by the passing, but he was a really good young Christian. And uh, we were doing meetings, and this guy stayed behind one evening, and he said, listen, I'm having a real problem. I'm seeking God, but there's real issues holding me back. Now, this doesn't happen unless you're seeking God. And it, now, I'm not saying it happens frequently, but it, it happened in this guy. I'm just going to tell you what happened. He was seeking God. And he said, there's something not right about me. He said, I know I'm saved, I'm baptized, I do all the things the church, but there's something not right. He said, I don't have that appetite for God. I don't have that desire. I know there's things wrong in my life. So we began to talk, and I said, well, tell me what's wrong. Do you know what he did? He said, I take a pen out, and I write all over my body. Every so often, he says, I'm compelled to do it. Write all over my body. It's a bit like, you know, people cut themselves. Well, I had a good idea what it was. And I said, well, tell me, uh, what do you think it is? Because of his theological views and so on, I didn't want to introduce anything that was going to upset him. I said, what do you think it is? He says, I think there's something in me that shouldn't be there. And I says, well, I I don't know. But I says, let's imagine that there is. Maybe, Maybe there is something, a spirit or something in you that shouldn't be there. And as you're seeking God... It's resisting because it has got a certain hold in your life. Somehow it got into your life, maybe from birth. I don't know how, but maybe it got in and it needs to be broken. It needs to be expelled. And as I talked to him and said, listen, if that's the case, this is what you need to do. You need to repent. You need to come before the Lord and repent of that and ask the Lord to break that and set you free. And you know what he said? He stopped me. He says, I need to speak to you a moment. Hold on. He says, as you are speaking to me, there is a voice inside me saying, don't listen to one word that man's telling you. I said, well, what do you think it is? He says, I think it's it's an evil spirit in me. I said, so do I. And I went for prayer with that young man, and when that young man was prayed for, he got a wonderful deliverance. Wonderful deliverance. And not only was he delivered on that front, but he himself being a Christian, as he sat there and we prayed with him and waited before him, we said, do you think there's anything else holding you back at the minute as you seek God, anything else? And and he spoke immediately. He says, God has spoken to me. And he said, unbelief. And he began to pray. And as we prayed over him again, this thing came out of him. A spirit of unbelief. I say, my friends, it wouldn't have happened unless he was hunting for God. But the enemy had a hold on his life. And believe you me, when you came to the Lord Jesus Christ, the enemy started a conflict. And any ground that he has into your life, he'll hold it. And the only thing that'll break it is when you pursue God, you're honest with God, and you're open with God, the Holy Spirit will then begin to expose the darkness. Do you remember the Lord Jesus came to the tabernacle or the synagogue? There was a man sitting. Listen, he had went to meetings for years. He went in and sat, and he, they took out the Torah, and they read it and rolled it, and he went through the paraphernalia and got up and read the Scriptures. That was the, the routine for the men. But this day the Lord was in the house. This day the Lord Jesus was present. The Holy Ghost was present. And guess what happened? When the Lord came, this man screamed at the back because there was a spirit in him, and the spirit was stung by the presence of the Lord. The Bible says that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And when we have the light of the Lord's presence, when we have the power of the Lord's presence, then darkness cannot stay and live where there's light. Well, very quickly, the Lord said to her, you'll have to pour out the little that you have. And my friend, you have 
This morning, you have the presence of the Lord in you. If you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit. But you say, I have just a little oil. Just a little oil. Not a lot happening in me, but just a little oil I've got. Well, you know, this woman only realized the value of the oil when it was all she had. When she got to the place where she lost confidence in everything else, and she knew that's all I've got, I've only got this little bit of oil, otherwise I'm beaten. I'm beaten on all fronts, but I've got a little bit of oil. She just didn't realize its value, and I'm learning more and more in my Christian life how little in my Christian life I have depended on this wonderful person who lives inside me, the Holy Spirit. What capabilities he has. I, I have God living inside me. Ought that not to change your life? Ought that not to make you like the Lord? Ought that not to produce things in your life that are different? God living inside you? She poured it out. Let's come to the conclusion. The man of God didn't say to her, just pour it out, because it would have been lost. And you see, friends, the Lord doesn't pour the Holy Spirit out anywhere, because it would be lost. He pours it out where there are vessels, empty vessels. These wee guys run up and down the street they, to the neighbors, got a wee container here, here, and they bring it all in, and they fill the room. Now, there's no point in them bringing a container up, and it's full of porridge, and say, do you want to pour some oil in? No good. And here's one that Mrs. Jones gave us, and this one's full of vegetable soup. No, no good. And, and here's one here, and, and this one's full of beans. No good. Empty vessels. We need empty vessels for the oil to be poured into. Well, how do you empty? Well, you have to throw the porridge out. You have to throw the beans out. You have to throw the vegetable soup out. My dear friend, that's why it's so necessary in our Christian lives, if we really want to know God, if we want to walk with God, if we want God to become real in our lives, that we have to let the Holy Spirit throw out what shouldn't be there. God can't fill a full vessel. God can't pour the oil into something that is already full of self. If there's unforgiveness in your heart, you can't be filled. If you have issues with a brother or sister, you can't be filled. If you have, my friends, things in your life that you've never confessed, if you have debts you owe and you've never paid, you can't be filled. You can't be filled. Listen, you could bluff me, you could bluff Brother Bertie, you can bluff any preacher now, really. But you can't bluff God. Bring empty vessels. Empty vessels. Well, when they brought them, I want you to notice as we conclude, the Lord said, you pour out what you have, you just pour it out into the empty vessels. Now, I used to think that this was all over in a few seconds, but it wasn't. Because what happened was the little boys were, had to close the door. And why they had to close the door, always in the Bible, the closing of the door is all related to faith. The Lord keeps unbelief out. The man of God very clearly twice said, keep the door closed, unbelief out. God won't demonstrate his power just in front of you. If you have an unbelieving heart, you'll not see it. The Bible says, according to your faith, be it unto you. So they close the door, and the wee guys don't know what's going to happen. The mother doesn't know what, what's going to happen, so she begins to pour. Now, she pours out the first bit. There's no miracle. There's no miracle in pouring out a wee bit of oil. We all do that, I'm sure, at home, you women cooking. But what happens is, after the initial amount that's in it is gone, it keeps flowing. And the little boys come over, and they hold the vessels, and they set them before, and it fills. And the little boys are standing there, and, and then it pours again. Now, I want to tell you, my friends, this room that they were in wasn't particularly exciting. It wasn't exciting, this room. This place where they slept, this place 
where they had memories of a husband and a father. This wasn't a very, very impressive room to any degree in the past. They didn't maybe have any great desire to be in it. But suddenly this room became the most wonderful place on the face of the earth because the oil was being poured out. <laughs> I have to say, in my earlier Christian life, I didn't find the place of prayer a very exciting place. I didn't particularly enjoy it. I got bored. I was out as quick as I could. I didn't enjoy it. It wasn't an exciting room. Then the Lord taught me some of the secrets of pouring out the oil. And my friend, I want to tell you, when you're in the presence of the Lord and the oil is being poured out, there is nowhere on earth like it. Nowhere. You see, God loves to be loved. Somebody I was saying recently in a meeting, I don't serve God. I don't work for God. I never want to work for God. I never want to do anything for God. If I ever start doing things for God, I hope God will intervene and stop me. I don't want to do anything for God. I want to work with God. It's a world of a difference. World of a difference. My friends, this woman kept pouring. And the little boys, the eyes opened up. They said, Mom, what in under goodness is happening? Mom, we can feel there's some kind of a presence here. There's, there's this oil that's being poured out here. Mom, what, what is happening? And the little children look bemused. And the mother says, your daddy's God is here. Your daddy's God's here. He has come to us. He's with us. It's him. <laughs> the reason why most of us settle for so little is because we have never really experienced the oil being poured out. But I tell you, friend, once you experience it, it's over. You'll never settle for anything else. Never. The oil. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father, we pray that you would take the words, Lord, that have come from your own heart and, Lord, apply them to our hearts. Create in us, Lord, that desire to make room for the Lord, that the Holy Spirit could come and fill us, and that the Lord could have his way. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.